Yeah. Oh, I'm okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so this is uh, this is the third in the in the series of uh, lectures by Julia, uh, lectures about uh, rational curves and hyperkelly manifolds, and uh, we're very eager to learn more about them. So with this, I turn the floor over to Julia. Please, Julia, I'm very happy to have you here. Thank you. It was uh, quite fun for me to uh, give these lectures and. Uh, and, uh, and prepare them. So, so thank you for having me. Um, so today I will, um, the plan for the lecture is uh, to um, sort of develop um, what I started last time uh, talking about uh, rash curves that are negative in some sense. And we talked about exceptional divisors last time and um, sort of so keep talking about that and then talk a little bit about rational curves in positive classes and then a little bit about uh, rational curves in isotropic classes. So the second part will be um, um, about curves sweeping out things that are positive in some sense and the last part will be about rational curves in uh, Lagrangian vibrations. Okay, so I'll start by a little uh, intro and recall about uh, Torelli theorems and, and a little bit about monodromy results on hypercal manifolds. And it will be um, sort of a little quick and um, introduction, just uh, reminding what, what we need. So uh, Torelli for K3s, Um, so one way of, of expressing it is that two K3s, complex K3s, are isomorphic if and only if there exists a Hodge isometry between their uh, second cohomology groups, integral Hodge isometry. And, uh, and also, uh, I guess, uh, we can also phrase it this way, that um, the, um, there exist, uh, sorry, there exist F uh, Hodge isometry, integral Hodge isometry. So integral Hodge. Hodge isometry just means it's an isometry of lattices and uh, preserves a Hodge structure. Um, they're extending, so um, so actually, maybe let me put it this way: If F is a Hodge isometry, sending a Keller class to a Keller class, then uh, there exists a unique, um, maybe let me call it G isomorphism between the two K3s, such that uh, G of the star is equal to F. Okay, and uh, and so for example, um, an isomorphism that does not satisfy this thing about sending a Keller class to a Keller class is those reflections in the minus two curves, where uh, again these minus two curves these are uh, classes of a reducible minus two um, curves. Okay, and um, so for, for hypercalor manifolds, the situation is a little more complicated. Uh, first, maybe I should say that these reflection in minus two classes cause non-separatedness. Phenomena. But in fact, uh, even if you have this non-separatedness issue, um, the corresponding K3s are still uh, isomorphic. And for hypercal manifolds, this is not true anymore because of a very important theorem of Heubrecht's. And uh, so maybe I'll put it two, in two points. First of all, uh, if X and, um, um, and X prime are birational, then they're non-separated points. 
and maybe I should say non separated points of what moduli space. How do you write separated? Separated points. I'll say a what moduli space in a second. And also conversely, um, non separated points of the moduli space. Uh, are uh, correspond to by rational hypercal manifolds. And so uh, of, of what? Of the moduli space of marked hypercal manifold. And so what is this thing? Um, I have, I fix a deformation class and uh, let lambda be the lattice corresponding to H2 of the deformation class, which of course is a deformation invariant just abstractly as a lattice. And, uh, and so I can define the moduli space of marked, pair, of marked uh, hypercalers, which contains these pairs. So this is a moduli space of pairs where um, this phi is uh, an uh, isometry of lattices modulo some, some isomorphism, okay? And so we'll always focus on one connected component, which I'll denote M delta zero. Okay, so when I say they're non-separated points, I mean of the moduli space of marked hypercal manifolds. Okay, and so, and conversely, um, um, non-separated points of the moduli space correspond to birational hypercal manifolds. And one remark that I should, uh, that is important in this is to remind you that if, uh, if, um, if I have a birational map of hypercalar manifolds, both hypercalars, then it's an isomorphism in co-dimension two, or in co-dimension one. Uh, so uh, they're, it, they're isomorphic away of a close subset on either side of co-dimension two. So in particular, you can identify the um, cohomology groups of these things. And this will be important later again. Okay, so the first issue when you try to generalize uh, the Torelli uh, theorem for K3 surface is that uh, you can't expect, and so this, sorry, maybe I should say, this is a Hodge isometry, integral Hodge isometry. So in particular, you can't ho hope for this theorem to, to, to hold naively. And, um, and so, in fact, the, um, the Torelli theorem for Vrubitsky Torelli theorem is that this is essentially all that happens. And, uh, and so maybe let me, um, let me, before we say the uh, actual, um, so maybe let, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, state a few different versions of this theorem, of the Torelli theorem. And um, one, uh, so the Torelli theorem is due to Verbitsky. And uh, so we have the period map in, uh, in the period domain inside the project projectivization, this open subset of the quadric in the projectivization of the complexified lattice, which to, uh, to each uh, hypercalar x phi you associate uh, phi of the class of the symplectic form, which is, uh, you can view it as a line in this projective space. And the statement of Verbitsky is that the fibers of, the, of, this, of this map from each connected component are, um, so for every point in the period domain, the inverse image of, uh, of the point is, are made of non-separated. in particular by rational, but you have to restrict to each connected component. Okay, um, if you wanna formulate it as for K3s in terms of, uh, of isomorphism of lattices, um, we need to impose, we need to introduce another um, um, character in, 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 this, uh, in this show, which is the monodromy group. And, um, and so the monodromy group, I'll be a little vague in, in defining it, 
is the group generated by parallel transport operators. along smooth families. So if I have a smooth family of hypercalic manifolds, their cohomology is identified uh, locally. And so um, that induces um, integral um, isometry of the underlying uh, integral cohomology groups. Okay, and, uh, and so in general, so for K3 surfaces, the, um, the monodromy group is maybe up to uh, index two thing. Uh, it's just the whole uh, isometry is of the lattice, but for hypercal manifolds, it's not the case anymore. And uh, and so the the statement for the Torelli theorem uh, again, this is uh, Rabitsky, and uh, also should put the names of Markman and Hoibrex. Uh, Uh, it's a following. So first I should say that um, X is, or maybe I'll just, uh, I'll just say one statement. X is birational to X prime uh, or bimeromorphic if they're non-projective, if and only if there exists a, an element of the monodromy group. And I'll just denote it by parallel transport operator uh, phi from H to of X. Z to H to of X prime Z. Sorry. Um, that is um, an isomorph, uh, an integral Hodge isometry. So um, I just want to underline this thing that you need uh, this condition on the isomorphism between the cohomology groups in order to be able to deduce that um, the two things are irrational. So this is like the big um, um, difference with respect to uh, K3 surfaces. And, uh, and maybe before um, uh, going further, let me remind you uh, that we already saw some examples of parallel transport operators. So an example is uh, we saw last time, so from last time, we saw that if E is a prime exceptional divisor, so a prime divisor with negative baville bogomolov square, then we knew that it was actually an exceptional divisor, maybe up to passing to a rational model, we could contract it. And, uh, and also that the reflection in E, um, which acted was an integral um, automorphism of H2 of X, uh, either X prime or, or X, I can identify them because they're birational. Um, but also it was the Gala group of, of a covering of, uh, so we had this family, this uh, the formations of X prime to deformations of Y, and this was the two to one covering uh, ramified, but so on the smooth locus, the, the monodromy of this family is really just this, uh, this reflection here. So these are an example of parallel transport operators. And in fact, they, this kind of parallel transport operators um, have a very important role in, in what follows. Okay, so, um, before going ahead with the story, uh, let me remind you that for K3 surfaces, um, the Neff cone is uh, the set of all classes that have non-negative intersections with all uh, minus two curves. And I think I said something about uh, the analog for K3, for hypercalers last time, but let me say it again. So for hypercalor manifolds, what you get is first you define the movable cone um, as of a hypercalor manifold or uh, as a cone generated by the classes. I'm being a little sloppy here in this definition, but let me, uh, let me be a little sloppy uh, by classes 
of movable line bundles, uh, uh, which are whose um, base locus has co-dimension greater or equal to two. That's what movable means. Uh, line bundles whose base locus has co-dimension greater or equal to two. Okay, and, uh, and it turns out that if you look at the movable cone and maybe you, you close it, this is the, is the union of the pullback of the NEF cones of all birational models of X prime. And here I'm looking at hypercalar birational models. So they're isomorphic in co-dimension two, so I can identify their homology groups with a, with a birational map and I can pull back the, the NEF cone. And uh, this is a convex cone. Um, and, um, and in fact, the, uh, the theorem, and uh, this comes from Oif Hoibrex and Buxom and Markman, is that this, uh, this thing here is um, the set of all classes that have non-negative intersection with all uh, the prime exceptional divisors. And um, so that was uh, one statement that I wanted to make. And, uh, and the other, maybe I'll just put it as a remark, um, is that if I denote by Wx the Val group generated by all, uh, so this is a group generated by the, the, these reflections um, associated to all the prime exceptional divisors in X, then uh, this of course acts on uh, the cohomology of X and also it preserves the positive cone. And, uh, and in fact, the intersection of this cone, this movable cone with the positive cone is a fundamental domain for this action. Okay, so um, it's just very convenient to be able to use these uh, reflections to move things around and, and place them in in the smoothable cone. Okay, so um, what what the the this theorem is saying is that the walls of the NEF cones correspond to the orthogonal complement of minus two classes, and so it's natural to want to find what the um, orthogonal complements of these guys are. And um, before I um, and so this is why uh, people started to think about how you can characterize these guys numerically. Uh, characterization of uh, numerical characterization, I should, should say, of these uh, prime exceptional divisors. Okay, and uh, it's not, quite possible to characterize these guys uh, numerically, but almost. And so, um, in fact, um, what you can characterize is uh, prime exceptional divisors and their limits, so to say. So before, um, before I, I say that, let me um, tell me you a little bit about deformation. Def formation of uh, prime exceptional divisors, which is kind of where I ended last time. Um, okay, and so maybe the statement, which is due to Markman, is the following. If, uh, if E is a prime exceptional divisor on X, uh, then uh, there exists an open subset of uh, the deformation space of X, where the class of E stays algebraic, such that uh, maybe let me write it subset U in this, such that um, the uh, divisor ET 
is a prime exceptional divisor on XT for T and U, okay? And uh, so, as I said last time, you know, the, the, the game is to produce rational curves and examples and then deform them to get rational curves elsewhere. And so this is a way to get, um, to deform these rational curves. Okay, so let me give you a sketch of, um, of the proof of this. And there's a subtlety at some point that I wanna mention uh, because in fact, uh, in um, similar arguments, there have been uh, kind of mistakes in, in papers online. So um, one has to be a little careful. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, okay, so let me see. So we, um, we can assume, we, because so we know from last time that uh, up to passing to another birational model, we can contract it. So I'll just assume that X is X prime because if I prove it for X prime, it, it will be um, true also for X. It's a, that's not hard to see. Um, and so then the, the other thing that we had was that this was generically um, either a P1 bundle or we had those two. So either a P1 bundle or, or we had the, the two rational curves meeting in transversely in one point. And in fact, um, Drell's also shows that these are the only classes. Um, so how do I wanna say it? Um, these, and of course their multiples are the only classes, only rational curves, maybe let me put it this, um, rational curves that sweep out. Um, the divisor E. Okay, so if there's a curve that, um, a rational curve that sweeps out, a divisor E, it has to be tangent to the fellation and it has to be one of these guys. Um, okay, so that, um, and then of course also the fact that um, um, because there's a, an open subset of the base where uh, this E is really, so an E is, sorry, E is birational. Um, now maybe let me, okay, let me just say it later. Okay, okay so, um, and um, yeah, so maybe I, I'll say it now, if you look at the, 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 the sort of the normal bundle of these curves inside X or X prime, um, this is just uh, as nice as it can be. So it's a omega C plus a bunch of trivial summons. Okay, and, um, and sort of using this uh, and the sort of type of arguments that I kind of sketched last time, you see that uh, again, um, these curves deform where their class stays algebraic. And, uh, and last time I also mentioned the fact uh, from Marklin is that the class of E is proportional to the class of, of the ruling. Of the, of the fibers here. Okay, and um, and so so using this, um, if you take a general uh, curve inside the deformation space of X, where the class stays uh, algebraic, and uh, you get a, a reducible component of the moduli space of these curves in 
in sort of the family here, and uh, which contains, say, the class of, of a curve here, uh, F from P1 to, uh, to there. And, um, and sort of the, uh, the, the normal bundle calculation tells you that uh, the, the moduli space is smooth at that point. And um, in fact, it, that's how you see that it's deformed. It's not only the moduli space is smooth, but also the map to the base is, is smooth around that point. So that tells you that if you look at the universal curve here and it, you look at its image in, uh, in X under the evaluation map, you get a divisor, maybe I'll call it uh, uh, and, um, and I should say two things about the divisor. The first thing is that the central fiber of the divisor contains an irreducible component that is actually E. And, uh, and the second um, is that because I chose a general curve, I know that in fact, the, um, the class of uh, the irreducible, uh, the class of the fiber of this divisor, relative divisor inside this family of hypercalor manifolds, it has to be proportional to the class of E. Because I chose a general curve and so the only algebraic class in the general deformation along that curve is the, the, the class of E. And so the subtle point I was saying is that in general, when you deform out and you deform back, like you're doing here, you in general only get something that contains strictly the divisor you started with. And uh, this sometimes is a source of confusion and, and mistakes. So I, I, I wanted to just um, say it out loudly. Um, to be careful about that. And, uh, but the point here is that uh, um, because I know that uh, uh, the class is, um, is the same as the class of E, it's or up to a multiple, it's, uh, I know that still, so even so in particular, it's the same, also the class of E zero is proportional to the class of E be a parallel transport along this, this family. And, uh, and because E is a prime exceptional divisor and there are no other uh, divisors in the linear system, the complement of this thing uh, should have the same class. So, so it'd be a, a different divisor than E in the same linear system. But because this is one for all K in uh, greater or equal to one, because E is an exceptional divisor that can't be. And so in particular, um, the, the, the complement of this, uh, so uh, in particular, E0 is uh, supported on E. So maybe it's, a, it's another multiple of E if maybe the central fiber is non-reduced, but in fact, using the, the normal bundle and the fact that the, these considerations that I made earlier, you show that in fact, the this, this fiber of this divisor in zero is reduced. And so in fact, this is equal to, uh, to that, okay? So this argument of deforming out and deforming back is something that is used a lot. And also in, uh, in sort of at some point later in the talk, uh, it will come up again. Um, and so, cause it's uh, such a standard um, way of doing things. I wanted to sort of point that out with this caveat of being careful that um, of what, of controlling what happens in the central fiber. Okay, and so, um, so what this means is that when I have a, um, an exceptional divisor, I deform it a little bit and it still is an exceptional divisor, but uh, the property is not closed as this example shows. Uh, if you take a K3, a singular K3 that is the intersection of a quadric and a cubic in uh, P4 meeting uh, that are tangent in one point. So this has like one A1 singularity. And I blow up the, the node. I have a, a K3 surface uh, and uh, the following class L, which is the pullback of 
the hyperplane section plus two times the exceptional divisor of, uh, of this resolution here. This is a minus two class. It's effective. In fact, you can show that when you deform out, it's a minus two class and the reducible curve of square minus two. So this is just to say that a limit of, of prime exceptional divisors may not be prime exceptional, even if, um, even if the, in the K of, case of K3 surfaces. This is, is an example of Markman. Okay, and so, uh, so what you call are stably prime exceptional divisors. Stable, stably prime exceptional. With, so uh, prime exceptionals and their limits, so to say. Okay. And so these guys now do have a numerical characterization. That depends on the deformation class. So for all deformation classes, they have been numerically characterized. I won't list it here if you're interested. Uh, so for uh, K3N, it was Markman. And um, Actually, I'm not sure if for the generalized Kummer they have been characterized. Maybe yes, but um, and uh, for the exceptional examples, uh, I'll say it again later when in a slightly more general form. Okay, so um, so this shows that we if uh, if this is the the positive cone of the K3 surface, and then we had uh, this uh, convex co cone inside this thing that uh, was what the smoothable cone. Or maybe it's closure, and so we have uh, the uh, the numerical characterization of the walls of of this thing. Okay, but what this thing was the the smoothable cone was it, um, itself a union of pullback of net cones of birational models. So this thing also was sort of uh, cut down in. Uh, in cones, so each of these guys is an F cone on some birational model. Okay, so then of course, what is natural to, so this didn't happen for K3s, of course, because birational things are isomorphic. And so then of course, you might wanna ask, well, what about these walls and how can they, can I, how can I characterize those? And so this is what is coming next. Um, so let me see in my notes if I forgot to say something about this. Okay, so uh, before going ahead, I should say that um, uh, a useful way of thinking about this in, is in terms of the uh, Mori cone. And so we'll have uh, dual statements. I'll, I'll say what I mean in a second. So this is a cone containing, is a closed cone contain, closed cone containing um, all classes of algebraic curves in X. Okay. And this is a dual to the Neff cone. Okay, so what I mean is uh, that if if I have uh, a curve which is an extremal ray, in the Mori cone, so I can't write it as a positive combination of two curves in the cone, then it will correspond to uh, our perp will be a face of the Neff cone of X. So this maybe is uh, all uh, among all of these, this will be the, say, the Neff cone of X. And so this is what I mean, the dual statement, okay? So the Neff cone of X is cut by the orthogonal complements to all of the extremal rays. Okay, and so why is this related to um, rational curves? Because 
if uh, R is an extreme array, so I mean it's a it's a a curve in the Mori cone, which corresponding which corresponds to a um, extremal ray of the cone, then and I suppose that R squared is uh, is negative. So again, on hypercalar manifolds, right? We had uh, the extension of the Bovillon-Bogomol form uh, to the second homology group. Maybe this is a, a form with rational uh, values, but still we have this pairing. And so, if the 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 square of, of the, the ray is negative, uh, then uh, you can use the phase point free theorem. in birational geometry to contract this curve. So you get a contraction. And um, what I mean here, um, this is a, um, a proper birational morphism and any curve that is contracted by this morphism is uh, belongs to that ray. Okay, and so in particular, so this is a, um, a, a why this is singular symplectic uh, variety, and uh, this is very rational, but there is an exceptional locus, which uh, may or may not be divisorial. The divisorial case is the case we, we looked at earlier, and uh, but still, this is uh, covered by rational curves. that are contracted by F and uh, that are in fact uh, belong to that, to that ray. So this is why you look for rational curves in, in, these, uh, in these walls. Once you, once you know how to describe the, the walls that um, divide the different NEF cones of the different birational models, then um, you, um, you know what are, if you have a numerical characterization of those walls, uh, then you um, get numerical characterization for the rays where to look for these negative rational curves. Okay. So um, what do we want to say next? Okay, yeah. So in fact, uh, you want to look for uh, numerical characterization. Of, uh, of these uh, extreme arrays. Okay, and um, for uh, moduli space of uh, bridge and stable objects on K3s, uh, this was done by Bayer McCree. Uh, and every wall in that sense corresponds to an actual wall in the stability manifold. And uh, they give complete characterization of, of what happened. And, uh, and so the, the term that I want to present here is uh, for uh, X, um, a projective hypercal manifold of K3 and type, uh, Bayer, Hassett, and Schenkel extend the results of Bayer McCree to an arbitrary projected deformation of, uh, of Hilbert steam of points on the K3. And so the technique, uh, I'll give a, a sort of um, a, a, a quick sketch of the, um, of the argument because um, it has the, the it's an argument that is used also for, okay, let me, maybe uh, as, I, as I say, as I sketch, um, I'll first state the result and then I'll sketch the proof. And then as I sketch the proof, I will sort of uh, stress uh, what are the elements that um, are used in many proofs of this deformation of rational curve kind of result. Um, so uh, hopefully it will be clear what I mean. 
Um, okay. So before I state their theorem, I had to I have to actually say something that I forgot to say earlier, which is the following. And and let me remind you already. We already said that last time that. Uh, for these moduli spaces, the H2 of MV, let me just drop all the, all the other decorations, is the orthogonal complement of the Mukai vector inside the full uh, cohomology of the K3. Okay, and uh, so the important thing here, so let me denote this uh, lattice by lambda. It's a unimodular lattice. It's um, you know, three copies of U plus two copies of the E8 uh, lattice, maybe up to um, a shift by minus two. Um, and so what Markman shows is that uh, there exists a, a canonical, so for every X of K3 N type, there exists a canonical extension of lattices, maybe canonical up to plus or minus, uh, from H2 of XZ into this, uh, this lattice, this extended K3 lattice, which generalizes this extension here. And in particular, uh, I'll denote this by theta X, this gives a Hodge structure of weight two on this lattice. So when I put gamma, no, that's a, what's it called? It's not gamma, it's delta X. Um, that's, um, I mean, it comes with this weight two Hodge structure that comes from this, um, from the H2 of XZ. And what are the properties or this extension? Uh, if I look at the orthogonal complement of the image here, it's, it's uh, just by you know dimension reason, right? My rank reason. This is just uh, one dimensional and uh, spanned by an element of square two n minus two, just as in this case, right? Where the dimension of uh, the Mukai, where of course two n is the dimension of x, right? Again, this is direct generalization of of that result. And what are the other things that I want to say uh, is that uh, I, uh, a certain uh, automorphism of, or maybe, let me put it this way, from H2 of XZ to H2 of X prime Z is a parallel transport operator if and only if uh, phi extends to um, integral, so this is integral Hodge isometry. Actually, sorry, sorry, no. So this just a, 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 an isometry of lattices. This is just a, a integral isometry of uh, between the H2 of two hypercalor manifolds is a parallel transport operator if and only if this um, isometry extends to um, extends to the, the, the K3 lattice here, to the extended lattice. So uh, if and only if phi extends to, uh, to a phi tilde from X, from um, gamma X, to, uh, delta X to delta X prime. Okay, so this is Markman's characterization of parallel transport operators. I said earlier, I gave the Torelli theorem. I said, not all isomorphism between the H2s has the possibility of being, um, uh, of induced, being induced by a rational map. And, um, and also, um, so you, you needed that condition of being a parallel transport operator. For K3N type, Markman has computed what the monodromy group is and the, the monodromy group is precisely the set of uh, integral isometries that extend to this um, um, uh, delta, uh, this extended lattice, okay? And, uh, and so in particular, 
uh, you can rephrase the Torelli theorem in the following way. Um, X and X prime are birational if and only if there exist, of course, of K3N type, uh, of K3N type. If and only if there exists a Hodge isometry. Uh, from lambda x to lambda x prime um, taking h2 of x to h2 of x prime z. Okay, so when I when I have here this extends to uh, the thing of the extended lattices, of course, I'm asking that the extension is compatible and uh, with the embeddings of the H2s inside this. Okay, so um, why do I need to say all of this? Um, first of all, this is a useful thing to keep in mind uh, when you know when you know if something is a is in the monodromy group, then that's a way, often one of the nicest way to check. Um, and, uh, but the other thing is that this, this extended lattice allows me to, to state the result of Bayer, Hassett, and Schinkel that I want to mention. And so, uh, so what do we have? Um, we have so X projective of K3N type. And, um, and this has, I have this um, embedding into the sky and the K3 lattice, which is unimodular. So it's isomorphic to its dual. And here I have this rejection uh, delta X dual into H lower two of X to Z. Okay, so um, because I will be giving you a characterization of the walls of the Neff cones in terms of the extremal rays that are dual to the, to the walls in the Mori cone, I want to be dealing with curve classes, not with divisor classes. So I'll be looking at this part here rather than here. Of course, they're the same over Q, but um, okay. And uh, so what is the statement of Bayer, Hassett, and Schenkel? Uh, it's the following. So X uh, H polarized um, hyperkähler of K3N type. Then the Mori cone of curves of X is generated by classes in the positive cone. In fact, this is it's simple to see that all the, the algebraic classes in the positive cone have to be classes of algebraic curves. Uh, plus the images of under this, uh, theta x dual of the following classes. Um, so A in the algebraic extended lattice of X. So I said that um, this guy has an algebraic, that has a Hodge structure coming from that of X. In particular, I can talk about algebraic classes. So this is what I mean with the following numerics such that a squared is greater or equal to minus two and uh, a dot v is less or equal to v squared over two. And then of course I want that uh, it has um, positive intersection with the ample class. Okay, so uh, depending on your interest, you may or may not care about the specific numbers that are here. Um, you do have classes that are not only minus two classes, in fact, you, you have other kind of squares. 
But, uh, but if, for those of, of you who know the, the volume of Cree stuff, he recognizes it's exactly the same thing. And, uh, and so I wanted to give you a brief, a very sort of uh, tell you what are the main ideas that uh, come into this theorem, because in fact, then the sort of same things are, uh, you get similar statements. on the other deformation types for other. I'm not entirely sure about the generalized Kummer case, but I know for O'Grady 6 and O'Grady 10, uh, this is a Mungardi Ravagnetta and this is a Mungardi Honorati. Um, and and sort of the the ideas are are the same, and they involve knowing what the monodromy group is, and uh, because of this um, question, what is V in this theorem? Oh yeah, sorry, it's a it's a, this thing here. So when um, uh, I have this embedding, and the orthogonal complement is, uh, I call it V, the primitive generator of the orthogonal complement. So it's well defined up to um, a sign, but, um, and, uh, and it's, uh, it has this, this square. And uh, this is, it's really the deformation. Um, so in the case of moduli space, the V is the Mukai vector. In this case, it's uh, the orthogonal primitive generator of the orthogonal complement of this inside this. Does that answer? Thanks, Ulla. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, and in fact, I mean, the, the, this and the embedding that this lattice extension that I um, described to you earlier is in some sense obtained by deforming the, this thing here. And, uh, and so when you, when you move uh, along with a parallel transport operator, you, um, the, the V of an arbitrary K3 and manifold will, will go to this V. And, uh, and, and the, the whole structure of the proof of the theorem is deforming to that case. The theorem is true there. And so then you deform back, so to say, and I'll be more precise in a second. And so then in that case, when you deform, V will be precisely the, the Mukai vector of, uh, of the moduli space. Um, okay, so um, so the structure of the proof of similar results for other deformation type is kind of this. So you know the, the monodromy group or somewhat you have to compute it. And generally it's a non-trivial to compute the monodromy group. And you wanna produce enough examples where you know how to cut the Neff cone So in, in the case of K3N, the moduli space of uh, uh, bridge and stable objects on K3s, and then you deform. That's the sort of the structure of, of these proofs. Okay. So the fundamental uh, result that you use to deform is the following. A little bit, we said that, uh, later and I'll, I'll the, ha, as it's stated, uh, this is in the Bayer Hassett Chinkle um, paper, but their version of this result, this result that I'm about to write by Emmerich Lubitsky, by Mungardi and, and sort of um, it's uh, more or less everybody has uh, rediscovered this, this kind of statement that I'm about to write. So uh, X uh, projective uh, hypercal manifold and um, R is a class of an extremal ray. Uh, 
uh, with negative square. And uh, if suppose that X prime is deformation equivalent to X, and I'm given a Hodge, uh, a parallel transport operator. Um, that has, uh, no, okay. So if the parallel transport operator uh, preserves the algebraicity of the class, so if phi of R, which I'll denote R prime is Hodge, so is an algebraic class, is a Hodge class. And if uh, there exists a Kähler class or a pod, yeah, uh, I don't ask X prime to be algebraic. A projective. So uh, if there exists a Keller class alpha such that alpha dot r prime is positive, parallel transport operator could reverse the orientation of the positive cone. So this is why you need uh, this condition. Okay, so uh, I want this to be a hot class and then there's condition. Um, then the, the conclusion is that a multiple of our prime is effective and represented by a cycle of rational curves. Okay, so we already sketched last time, we'll give a sort of rough sketch of why uh, extreme rational curves deform. So, uh, so the two main ingredients in the proof of this is uh, this thing that extreme rational curves deform. And two, um, the second thing is that uh, you need to produce a family given Given phi, this parallel transport operator, you need to produce a family um, realizing this parallel transport operator. And preserving the algebraicity condition. condition on R, right? Because we know how to deform where the class stays algebraic. And so we want to do it when, you know, when we, um, uh, a priori, this, this uh, parallel transfer operator just comes from one family. We don't know that along that, that family, the class stays algebraic. Okay, so I think that with these two ingredients, you can kind of imagine how, how the proof goes. Um, and, um, um, okay, so maybe let me just uh, say um, one word about how you prove the, um, this, this theorem here. And so, as I said earlier, these, the, these inequalities star are valid for moduli spaces of sheaves on K3s by the Meyer, Meyer McCree thing. Okay, so the sort of the proof of the theorem is the following. Uh, you have this X and R is an ex with an extreme array. And um, using the fact that uh, sort of, so what you wanna do is you wanna produce a parallel transport operator that brings this pair uh, to, a, say, a Hilbert scheme, or in fact, even a moduli space of sheets on the K3, and uh, some phi of R, which is this R prime in this theorem, that would satisfy the assumptions on the proposition. And, uh, it, and in order to do this, 
it, it, uh, you need to know what the monodromy group is, of course. Uh, okay, so um, then you apply the proposition. I mean, this is a rough, very rough sketch. And uh, our prime is a cycle represented by a cycle of rational curves. And uh, so it's in the Mori cone, is effective, is in the Mori cone. So it satisfies those equalities in the statement on the theorem, and so, so does R. Those uh, red things that I, okay, so you, this shows one containment. Yeah, the very rough idea. And uh, conversely, if you have uh, one of those classes where uh, A satisfies uh, these, um, these inequalities, again, uh, so first of all, you, you can assume um, uh, the statement is, you know, already know that it's true for positive curves, so you only want to know that it's, uh, you, you can assume that it's for this. Um, so what you do is uh, you find a parallel transport operator again, find a parallel transport operator to a Hilbert scheme or moduli space and uh, to some R prime. Um, by Bayer McCree since this R prime satisfies the condition, satisfy the, those inequalities. Um, it's uh, not only effective, but, um, but also it, it's an extreme array. And I mean, here I'm, I'm cheating a little bit, but sort of the rough idea you deform there, it's an extreme array. And then because an extreme array, you can deform back. Again, using the proposition. Okay, so this was kind of kind of rough idea, but uh, it's uh, the, what I would hope, I, I was hoping to transmit is how uh, important uh, the deformation argument, which usually work on an open subset, but then maybe you, you know, you have to be a little concerned what happens on the limit, but sort of, and then the monodromy arguments, those are the two sort of uh, main ingredients. And, um, and so in particular, um, this gives a complete characterization of what the walls of the Neff cones are for hypercal manifolds of K3N type. Okay, so in the remaining time, I will uh, say a little bit about uh, positive classes. Um, so rational curves with positive square. Okay, and so the first, uh, the first example is, is the following uh, trivial example. If I have C inside S, uh, rational curve, an ample rational curve. Uh, in particular, C squared is positive. Then I can look at uh, the product of S times S, the symmetric product Sn minus one. And this gives a, uh, by rational map to Sn. And uh, the image here is, so the image is a uni-rule divisor. And, uh, and the class of the, the class of the ruling
is of course the class of C times a length n minus one point, right? As you vary the length n minus one point. And this in fact is exactly the class of C in H lower two of S and Z, where here it's at the class in H two of S Z, which sits inside the sky. Okay, so that's a kind of uh, first easy way to construct curves. And so in particular, the, it has positive both the to mold square. Okay, um, another uh, example is the following. Again, I start from a curve inside a K3. This time it's not necessarily rational, but I assume that, so it's a singular curve. I assume that its normalization has a G1K. So it has a K to one map to P1, okay? So this gives uh, a map from P1 to the Hilbert scheme of K points on the K3, okay? And, uh, and if, uh, so if uh, the curve C is in a primitive linear system, then uh, maybe I think I also need a condition that C is uh, a delta node, delta nodes. Then the image of this rational curve has class L where L is the linear system minus G, the genus of the curves, delta plus K minus one times RK, where this is the, the class of the ruling of the, of the Hilbert Chow divisor. So, uh, and this observation is uh, due to, oh, it's um, Knudsen, why did I change color? Sorry. Knudsen. La Ligiesa. And Mongarde. And again, you can sort of look where, what is a locus swept out by this, this, this class. And in fact, you know, these are all uh, sort of low side that also you can realize as, as um, Sort of variation of stability and bridge and uh, sort of the, from um, you can uh, the these loci um, can be reinterpreted in terms of bridge and stability. Um, what is another uh, way of producing rational curves is by means of uh, severity varieties. And, uh, and sort of, and generalization sort of. And uh, what I'm gonna say next is uh, in a paper of uh, Francois Charles, uh, Mongarde, uh, and uh, sorry, should we sometimes write names correctly? Uh, and uh, questions. Okay, so. So what's uh, um, what the situ what, what is the situation? It's the following. So I have on a K three um, linear system of genus P, and I take inside this uh, T um, um, a reducible component. of, so actually maybe let me just say, okay. So this is, um, para, this parameterizes uh, curves of geometric genus G. So for every G less or equal to P, I can consider low, uh, an irreducible component of the locus parameterizing curves uh, of geometric genus G. Um, maybe closure of that locus um, and whose general, whose general member is nodal. Uh, 
So this is uh, an irreducible component of the severity uh, variety parametrizing um, or the closure of the severity variety parametrizing curves with delta nodes where delta is P minus G. Okay. And uh, this is known to, if not empty, as dimension G. So T has uh, dimension G. This is an irreducible component. And in fact, for K3s, these are, are non empty. Uh, and in fact, uh, for K3s, they're non empty. I think I should credit Chen here. Uh, okay, so what I use these things, let me denote by CT to T the universal family of these curves. And then I can take the relative symmetric uh, product of this family of curves. And uh, let me take the G plus one symmetric product. And why do you wanna take this? Because this thing here now is uniruled. Why? Well, uh, if I have a curve with geometric genus G, so maybe I can go to the normalization and uh, G plus one, it mapped to the Jacobian of, of C with uh, generic P1 fibers. Okay, so that thing is uniruled. And, um, and the claim in, um, in this Charles Mungati Pacenza paper is that uh, for every G less or equal to P, I can find uh, a uh, question. Is that, is that easy to see that that's in fact P1? Is that uh, that, that fiber? It's a linear system of, uh, of points, right? Right, but then do we know it's actually surjects to the Jacobian? Could it be to something else? Uh, okay, if, if Enrique is here, you should, uh, should answer the question. It could be, it could be theorem. Okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. Sure. All right. I think I should have known the answer. Uh, I made at some point I knew the answer. Thread is a G symmetric product. What's that? For the G symmetric product, that's true, and it's very rational. That's and true. the G minus one, it surjects. Right, 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 right. Uh, sorry, yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so uh, the claim is that for any a uh, fixed geometric genus, I can find an irreducible component of the closure of the severity variety uh, with the following property. Uh, if I look at uh, the M, if I look at the map, the rational map to the Hilbert scheme of G plus one points on the K3, this map is generically finite. onto its image, uh, which uh, in fact, if you count dimension, uh, this has dimension, right? Dimension of B is G, so this is two G plus one, uh, which is, a, so this, the image is a unirule divisor. Okay, and, um, and so slightly more generally, Um, for every k from one to n, uh, and maybe you wanna choose the g appropriately, um, here what you get is you can construct uh, things like this, ck cross s n minus k dot 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 n to sn. And uh, of course, as, as long as the because for every G greater, less or equal to P, you find such things, then you have them for, for all these Ks. And, um, and so, and, and so the, the image here is, uh, let this be the image, and this is a uni rule divisor. And again, you can compute the class of the ruling. And you also compute the class of the of the divisor itself, which is unirule. Okay, and uh, so I think in the proof of 
of these class computation, there's, there's that little slip that I mentioned earlier about when you deform and then you deform back, the whatever you get in the center of fiber might be strictly contained, but uh, I was in touch with the with them and, and the, the main results of the paper hold, uh, still hold. So the, so if, if you're interested in, in looking at, um, at, uh, at this paper and to, I'm gonna state this main result in, in a second, but um, I think there's gonna be an update of the paper coming up soon. Uh, all right. So, so I, I, I won't mention what this, the class of these things are. Um, it get a little technical, but again, you interpret it in terms of uh, a curved class on the K3 plus a multiple of the, the ruling in the Hilbert child morphism because that's what the H2 of a Hilbert scheme is. And so um, once you have enough of these sort of geometric constructions that give you unirule divisors with positive squares, then again, the, the game is use monodromy and deformation arguments to move these things around and then try to answer the question, if I give you a hypercalor manifold uh, with a positive divisor H, um, will I find unirule divisors in linear system H or multiple of the linear system H? And what are the curve classes that, that sweep out these divisors? And, uh, and so in fact, this is what this, uh, this uh, paper of Charles Mungat and Piacenza prove. And uh, I won't uh, write the statement uh, explicitly because it would get a little technical, but um, uh, maybe let me just uh, say in sort of, I want to say a little bit about Lagrangian vibration. So I'll, I'll just uh, find lots of, uh, of uni world divisors. Um, with positive squares. And, uh, and sort of this is maybe doesn't look so appealing to say this, but first of all, there are um, some conjectures related to um, coming from the work of Voisin about finding uh, uni rule divisor ample divisors uh, in on hypercal manifolds that are uni ruled. So sort of that's in the spirit of that. And um, and when I say lots, it's uh, it's the, the, the things obtained by moving these things, but I should also mention that there are obstructions. Um, so given a class, a class, not a class a class of an irreducible curve um, oh, uh, still in the K3N case, um, Georg Oberdick, um, Shen and Nien have given obstruction uh, to um, existence of divisors swept out by rational curves in class beta. And so if uh, you're interested in this kind of thing, you should definitely go look at this paper. But, uh, I won't say much about that, uh, but the obstruction comes from Grimmel Witten theory. So uh, uh, I think uh, you might find it satisfying to look at it. It's a, it's a very nice paper. I, uh, I just don't have time now. And I also don't know it that well, so. Um, okay, but if you're interested in producing rational curves on, on hypercal manifolds, then uh, certainly in, in, if you look at the positive classes, then I think uh, these are the two papers that you should look at. Okay, so 
In, uh, in the remaining uh, very little time, I will talk a little bit about uh, sing uh, rational curves in Lagrangian vibrations. No need to rush. I mean, we've. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. It's, a, it's an informal seminar, so those who have other appointments, they can just go to the other appointments. But I think we'll be all very happy to listen to it. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll, 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 you know, I'll start talking and then. Uh, when <laughs> maybe I'll okay. Let's see. Uh, rational curves. Um, on in Lagrangian vibration. Okay, so now X to B uh, will be a Lagrangian vibration. So the general fiber is a, an abelian variety and uh, it's an integral system in, and uh, the map also is flat. So in particular, it's equidimensional. That's a very nice property. And uh, another uh, feature is that um, the discriminant locus So uh, the set of points corresponding to singular or non-reduced fibers is uh, non-empty and of codimension one. Okay, and so for example, in the baville mukai system, of course, if B is the linear system, then delta is the locus of uh, singular curves. And, uh, and if I have uh, the fiber over one of these points is uh, the compactified Jacobin of a certain degree of that curve. And, um, and in particular, it contains, um, for example, let's do an example of a nodal case. It's, uh, it contains a Picard group of the, of the curve, which is an extension of the C star. We saw it in the first lecture, right? Big zero, that's detailed. Okay, and so in particular, it's uh, it's full of rational curves, and so this uh, this um, this phenomenon happens in general for for singular fibers, and uh, there are a few things I want to say. Um, so maybe I'll say something about uh, reducible curves, reducible fibers. Um, so this is um, some. Uh, some work in progress that I'm doing with uh, Chiara Kamere. And uh, so let, um, okay, how do I want to say this? Um, so F is that, and uh, now V is, will be an isotropic class. And it's uh, the class of, I mean, you can think of B as PN, but in general, it has Picard rank one, so there's like a generator. Okay, and so this is an isotropic class. So the Bovillebogue model form of B is equal to zero. Um, and so let me maybe, um, okay, then so delta is a discriminant and it will be a bunch of components. And then uh, it may be reducible, but it may not be irreducible. And over every component, uh, I have a bunch of, I, I will write it as uh, a bunch of uh, irreducible components, which I denote by D, I, J. Okay, and uh, so the first uh, uh, remark that, um, I don't know, maybe let me write it as, uh, okay. There's a series of, of, of results. So one, uh, I mean, this is actually just a, a lemma, uh, these delta J D I J's. Um, so let me write it this way. If uh, M delta I is not irreducible, then uh, the D I J's are prime exceptional divisors. Okay, so in particular, the union rule, they're covered by rational curves and so on and so forth. And, and I mean, this is not really any, it's a trivial statement to make, but, and uh, the second thing is that there's, um, 
the following short exact sequence. So, um, so first of all, I should uh, define the frame lattice. This is a directionalization of results for elliptic K3 frame lattice is the orthogonal complement of the isotropic class modulo the isotropic class itself. Uh, and I denote it like this. And this is exactly what you do in, in elliptic um, surfaces. You look at uh, the classes that are orthogonal to the elliptic vibration, the fibers of elliptic vibration. And then you don't want to consider the, the, the Z, uh, the, the isotropic class itself. And this is a negative definite lattice. Negative definite. Okay, so in the, in the case of uh, say elliptic K3s, for example, you look at this negative definite lattice and you look at the minus two classes and those are exactly the curves that are the irreducible components of the singular fibers. Okay, these are exactly, if there's a reducible fiber, then there will be a minus two classes in this frame lattice, which corresponds to, to those things. Okay, and so we have sort of the analog generalization for higher dimensional hypercalors, which is as follows. So first of all, um, there's a following exact sequence. Uh, here I have uh, DIJs. Um, so here I sum over all the irreducible components of the discriminant downstairs. And now I only want to, I, I want to miss out on one component over every. So this is a, the same thing you do for K3 surfaces. If there, if there is a section, you only care to look at, at the curves that don't, uh, in the irreducible curves that don't intersect that section, because that's kind of redundant. So this is why this is coming from. So there's a short exact sequence, zero goes to the frame lattice and it goes to the Picard uh, pick zero of MK, where uh, this is a base change to the generic point. Uh, okay, and uh, if the fibers were principally polarized, this would be exactly the modal, modal vague group of the vibration. In general, or this is a F, sorry. In general, uh, because there might not be a section or because the fibers may not be principally polarized, uh, these are only maybe isomorphic up to up tensorization by Q. Okay, and so you have this, uh, so now in this frame lattice, you have uh, these classes that are irreducible components of the discriminant locus, and then you have this part that is this thing coming from uh, the pick zero of, of the generic fiber. But if you want, maybe up to looking at Q coefficients, this comes to from, to, from sections of, of the family. Um, so this is yeah, the analog of the mordal Bay group. Okay, and so you want a way in the, in the same way when when you're looking at elliptic K threes, you look at the frame lattice and you and you look at the minus two classes and you know that uh, they come from the irreducible components of the fiber. You want to say something similar of this form, and um, because you know that these are prime exceptional divisors, you know that at least you know if you have a numerical characterization, then you might be able to identify what these guys are. And so what the statement is that if I have a class alpha NFB, uh, this lies in this direct sum DJ, uh, if and only if there exists a lift of alpha of alpha in, uh, in V perp, um, that is, Stably prime exceptional. Uh, okay, so uh, we know that at least for the um, stably prime exceptionals and in the known examples, we have numerical characterization of these. And so this is kind of um, uh, 
it, telling you that in the frame lattice, the, the equivalent of the roots would be numerically the things that are uh, numerically st prime exceptional, stably prime exceptional. Okay, so um, anyways, the, the mm, sort of uh, the, the upshot of this is that any nice property you can think of holds for K3s, holds for hypercal manifolds, maybe with a little bit of modification. But um, um, but that you have all these nice uh, rational curves that um, correspond to that are in the singular fibers of uh, here in the reducible fibers of Lagrangian vibrations. And maybe let me take a few more minutes to say sort of morally, where do these cur curves come from? And, uh, and so I like to give you kind of two answers. Uh, one is uh, the characteristic foliation on the discriminant hypersurface. So on any hypersurface in a hypercalum manifold, the symplectic form induces a foliation and the foliation is in general not algebraic. In fact, uh, if I have an ample hypersurface uh, and it's smooth, then the characteristic foliation cannot be algebraic. But in fact, in the case of Lagrangian vibrations, Huang and Aguizo show that in fact, the characteristic foliation is algebraic. And, uh, and if, uh, so at ev over every component, so over, um, uh, if I look at the fiber over a general point in one component, if um, so, either the the underlying the the fiber is non-reduced, but the underlying reduced uh, fiber is smooth. In which case, the foliation, the leaves of the foliation are elliptic curves. Or uh, so in uh, in the in the other cases, so when the uh, and B is singular um, and the, the reduced up part is singular, then the leaves are algebraic and in fact, they're rational. And so the same, they're the same rational curves that we find in, in that are these uh, in the prime from the prime exceptional things. So those are again, the leaves of the algebraic relation. Um, Okay, and uh, the, I mean, these, uh, this paper of Aguizo, there's a series of papers about singular fibers in codimension one, which is uh, kind of very neat. And it, there is an analog of the sort of Kodaira classification um, using, you can um, um, maybe being a little sloppy, I can say you can uh, define an equivalence relation on these fibers by saying two points are equivalent if they're connected by one of these rational curves. And they call this, uh, it's not, it's, I mean, we have to be a little careful about what you're saying, but kind of uh, just to give you an, an idea. Um, so um, you get something called a characteristic cycle, which they denote by theta. Uh, just uh, by following these rational curves around in some sense. And, uh, and they give a characterization of what these characteristic cycles are, which uh, in these cases are, are chains of rational curves and uh, they follow the Kodaira classification. Um, so um, possibly allowing infinite cycles though, there's a little uh, caveat here. Um, and uh, and the other uh, source of uh, rational curves is from, and then I, I'll say this and then I'll, I'll stop. Um, um, the other source is from uh, groupscape actions.
and this is related to what we uh, what I discussed on the first lecture uh, when I proved the Yao Zaslow formula. And, and a crucial point was this pick zero of the family of curves acting on the uh, Boville Mukai system and uh, the um, existence of rational curves related to points that have non zero Euler number. And the non zero Euler number was detected in by the shape of the Picard zero of the curve acting. And so if there was an abelian part in that group scheme, in, in that the fiber of that group scheme acting on the thing, as long as you're an abelian part, the Euler characteristic was zero. And so similarly, so this is, uh, I'll be very vague, it's a sort of uh, general thing that I've been thinking about recently. Uh, and uh, maybe I'll get five minutes and then I'll stop if that's okay. Um, Sure, go ahead. Yes, of course. So, um, so if the fibers, uh, so if I have an integral system uh, with irreducible fibers, um, then um, already by work of Markushevich and also uh, Arin Kin and Fedorov. Um, there is a, a commutative group scheme acting uh, on this thing in such a way that the smooth locus of like vibration is a torsor under this group scheme. This is a, some sense of relative Albanese variety, whatever that is. And, uh, and again, we have sort of the uh, um, Chevalier decomposition of these group schemes, and in fact, sorry, maybe I should say it asks, and it, and it asks with affine stabilizers. If uh, if the fibers are irreducible and uh, and the smooth locus of the thing is a torsor, then it asks with affine stabilizers. Affine stabilizers. So uh, it means that the the stabilizer will be finer group in here uh, plus some subgroup of that part here. And so uh, using the fact that it's an interval system, what you can check is that the locus where the dimension of the affine part is greater or equal to delta has co-dimension less or equal than delta. And in fact, you can prove that um, you can have equality here. And so if non-empty, well, you can show um, you show that um, if, so if I have a locus, how did, how did I call it? Say Z delta. So maybe delta is a locally closed subset where the affine part has a fixed dimension. Um, then uh, if I look at a fiber over those, um, over that locus, in fact, it has, uh, or maybe the normalization, it has an open orbit. So I have the action of this thing here has an open orbit. And, um, and in fact, it's, um, if I look at the Albanese map of this thing, um, the fibers are compactification of the, so what I mean here, so maybe the fibers are compactifications of the affine part. So what, what, I'm being a little vague here, but what I want to say is just that, uh, you know, in co-dimension one, uh, you have these um, sort of rank on degeneration of uh, abelian varieties. And so you have these, these rulings and you have these rational curves, but then in fact, um, you know, depending on the de decomposition of the, um, of the abelian group scheme acting, uh, you have these larger and larger sets in the fibers that are spanned by, by these rational curves. And the dimension of these things correspond to the dimension of uh, the affine part. And, uh, and so here, um, the issue for the moment is just to, to show that there would be no empty, but um, if not, this would, uh, um, anyways, I mean, I'll stop here. I mean, it's, um, I can maybe say, yeah, 
I'll stop here. Oh, great. Questions? Well, first, maybe first, before we question, maybe we should, uh, we usually have like two rounds of applause. Maybe the first round of, uh, of applause already comes now. And that, that was, uh, that was a, a lot of work and really well done. Thank you so much, Julia. And now, uh, how about questions? Yes, I have one question. I mean, in the space of bridge and stability condition, there, there are often uh, brilliant walls. So this right. must correspond to, uh, to prime exceptional devices, right? And yes. No, so I don't understand the question. So in the space of bridge and stability condition, there are brilliant walls sometimes. Yeah. To find those. So this must correspond to prime exceptional divisors. Of square minus two. Of square minus two. What are those? Can you describe them? So I think I, I, I said something about that uh, in the maybe second lecture. I can't remember. Um, yeah, you, you, uh, you have a spherical object. Uh, so it has square minus two that is perpendicular to your Mukai vector. And, uh, and if you look at um, uh, the space of stability conditions where the phase of the two things align, um, then you get, uh, I mean, you get these, uh, I mean, uh, these are loci where the Homs from a, a stable object with, a, with spherical Mukai vector into your guise is non-zero, or maybe Homs from your guise into A is non-zero. I'm not oh, being okay. very clear, but so um, if I have a spherical object, uh, then that gives you, these are what biomimicry call the Brillnitter walls. Oh. And Brillnitter walls because they're given by the non-vanishing group. Uh, I mean, of course, if, if A is equal to O, which is so a spherical is object, that's, a, yeah. that's why it, they're called Brillnitter walls. Okay. I had a somewhat related question. When, uh, when, when you did this, uh, uh, well, not the, you discussed uh, the uh, the boundary of the NEFCON for O'Grady examples. Is that does it help at all that uh, O'Grady's are also related to modular of shifts, or you just yeah don't yeah yeah. Shifts? So 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 in fact, uh, the absolutely yeah. In fact, uh, uh, O'Grady is a is um is a resolution of modular space of sheaves, mm -hmm. and uh, you can do the Bayer McCree stuff for a gritty, singular or gritty 10 moduli spaces. Mm -hmm. And that gets, so you get by rational geometry of the singular models of a gritty 10, but mm -hmm. that already is enough to, uh, okay. yeah. Um, enough modulo, there's something else you need. Um, so this actually, the O'Grady 10 thing has been worked out recently. I haven't looked at the paper in detail, but I think they also need uh, uh, a result of mine on, um, so in particular, I think if you look only at the moduli space of case, uh, singular moduli spaces, you only get prime exceptional divisors of square minus six. But in fact, there's also prime exceptional divisors of square minus two. And uh, they correspond to the theta divisor of the intermediate Jacobian vibration. So I think that uh, you you do use moduli spaces of sheaves on K3s, but I think mm -hmm. in that case you also need something else coming from the intermediate Jacobian vibration. Uh, speaking of intermediate Jacobian, this is somehow that that in the in the eventual. It wasn't the plan, but not in the actual lectures, right? So maybe you know, in some time in the future, that you should. Talk more about that. I don't. Oh, sure. Uh, uh -huh. Any time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. More questions. Well, 
Well, if not, it's been a lot of work for Julia, and it uh, was very a lot of information for to digest for us. And so we'll thank Julia for these lectures, and we'll uh, we'll meet again in a week a week from today. Uh, thank you, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay. Uh, stop.